Luke says they have excellent vision, but not smell. We are so happy to have Bob Long with us tonight to share his knowledge and expertise. Bob has been with the, the Maryland Natural uh, Department of Natural Resources for 19 years. Uh, he's broadcasting all the way on the Eastern Shore um, from Herlock, where he is uh, works in the Cambridge office. And he is very much um, in charge of establishing habitats and monitoring the populations for bobwhite quail, wild turkey, and the um, tough grouse in Maryland. Uh, we're happy that he is here and to talk to us about turkeys. Where, Bob, are you with us? I'm with you. Can you see me? Great, and then one last thing. If you have questions, please write them in the chat box. I'm gonna serve as Bob's um, interrupter in chief and throw them in when, when they make sense. Um, and we'll clean up the questions at the end other that we don't get to. Bob, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Brown. I will share my screen. Hopefully it works. Great to see so many folks on here. It's um, it's good. There's, you know, I've done several of these Zoom type of meetings, and uh, and you know, it's kind of what we have to do now. But it it has increased participation in these types of things, and it's a good way for us to to get some information out to everyone and and interact with people that um, that we might not otherwise. So. Let's see. So can you see that? Yep, we're all good. All right, great. Okay, well, like uh, Brahman said, we're going to be talking turkey tonight. And based on the chat comments, it looked like there was a lot of folks with some good information about turkeys already and some, some interesting things. And they kind of stole a little of my thunder um, with with a few of the slides but um but that's all right we're gonna we're gonna um, talk talk about turkeys for um, a little while here and if you've got any questions feel free to put it in the chat I can't see the chat so um, if, if you can just let me know if there's a, a question about anything so you probably remember from elementary school or or maybe middle school every thanksgiving the teacher would would say you know to tell you that ben franklin uh, lobbied to have the wild turkey as the national bird uh, instead of the bald eagle and that's kind of been proven to, to not really uh, be 100 percent accurate but he did think that turkeys were a um, more respectable bird and a bird of courage, uh, but he 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 also threw in that they're a little vain and a little silly, and um, I would probably agree with that after uh, studying and working with turkeys for for a number of years now. Um, they're it's they're a fascinating bird, um, and uh, there was there were some good comments in the chat earlier about you know their intelligence or lack of and and things like that but um but anyway they're an interesting bird and definitely um something i've enjoyed working with so let's go back and talk a little bit about tur wild turkey history and these are turkeys in general not the subspecies that we have in in maryland and uh as bronwyn said they're in the family pheasianidae and that includes things like grouse and quail partridges and and also turkeys and based on the fossil records, um, their earliest ancestors uh, go back over 20 million years ago. But wild turkeys, as we know them, probably evolved around 11 million years ago. So they've been here for quite a while. And then throughout uh, history, they've played a role in a lot of um, uh, cultures and and they they definitely were a food source uh, for a, a lot of, of people and uh, kind of an interesting fact is that the the Mayans and Aztecs uh, really wor worshiped turkeys and, and in fact I think during certain time periods they didn't use them as food as much as they as they were 
religious, you know, ceremonial symbols. And the, there's, there's certain time periods where the only bones they have are from turkeys that were buried with, with people in tombs and things like that. So it's uh, quite, quite interesting. Uh, the domestication of turkeys probably occurred around 700 to 200 BC in Mexico, and uh, that's where we um, we started to raise them and fatten them up and make them a little tastier. Um, so, and then and then those got uh, transported around the the world, really taken back to Europe, and um, and then came back to. America with European settlers. Um, so yeah, and there, I think there was a comment about about uh, turkeys and how good they are to eat. Uh, a question I get pretty frequently, uh, especially from non-hunters, is they want to know, you know, what does a wild turkey taste like in comparison to the butterball you get from the grocery store? And um, uh, I can I can tell you that they're they're quite a bit different. They're not not really anything alike. They're they're good in, in their own way, but it's a darker meat. It's um it's not it's not as big as plump as as fatty. So it's um yeah it's a it's a little bit different, but uh, good in its own way. And as I said, it's a it surely was an impor important food source for Native Americans and early settlers, and they seem to be quite abundant uh, during that time. So there are two species of turkeys um, in North America. One of those is the oscillated turkey. And they're, except, I mean, our wild turkeys, which is, is on the, um, the right, might have been, might be left for you, I'm not sure. But um, our, the, the wild turkey is the species that we have in the United States. And uh, the, Oscillated turkey is much gaudier and has these very odd uh, head kind of uh, protrusions on their head that change color. So it's a that's a, a really interesting bird down there. But it lives in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. So here's a range map of all the turkeys in in North America. And as I said, I, I'm assuming you can see my pointer on there. Uh, but this is where the oscillated turkeys are found. And then the wild turkey species is found in uh, North America and Northern Mexico. And there's five distinct subspecies of wild turkeys. So in the blue is the Eastern wild turkey, which of course is what we have here in Maryland. And there's also an Osceola subspecies found only in Florida, the Rio Grande, Turkeys are sort of in the plains and in Texas. Uh, there's been a few that have been uh, transplanted to the West Coast. Miriams tend to be a, a mountain a tur turkey that does better in mountains. And uh, then the Goulds is found in Mexico and uh, parts of Arizona and New Mexico. Bob, so for what? Does yep. that map show turkeys in Hawaii? Did I say that correctly? Yes, yeah, there are turkeys in Hawaii. There's turkeys in 49, 49 states. Yep. So they were, I, I don't know if they were native there, but I think Hawaii has game birds from all over the world that have been released. All right, so for the rest of this talk, we'll be focusing on, oh, my, my light goes off if I, I'm behind my screen here. Uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll be talking about the eastern wild turkey, Meliagris gallopavo sylvestris. And so we'll just get into a little bit of uh, basic turkey biology. And I think somebody mentioned this, but they, they spend most of their time on the ground, uh, at, at least daylight hours on the ground. They prefer to run when they're, when they're scared. And they can run quite fast. They can run about 25 miles per hour, um, but they do fly, and they they fly pretty well for a, a big sort of cumbersome bird. They they've been uh, clock going 55 miles per hour in the air, but short distances only, 
and uh, and that and they typically will run as opposed to um, fly. But they they roost in trees at night, and that's just uh, security um, measures because there's uh, things out there that will will uh, uh, eat turkeys. Uh, but they're still susceptible to some degree at night because great horned owls actually are uh, one of the main predators of turkeys. Even adult turkeys uh, will get plucked off the limb by a great horned owl every now and then. Uh, they're omnivores and they feed on a variety of, of uh, materials, seeds, fruits, green vegetation, insects, um, even little frogs and things like that that they, that they run across probably opportunistically. They're exceptionally wary and, and that's why I, was, I saw the comment about they're not real intelligent. Uh, and, and that may be the case in uh, pen raised birds, but wild turkeys have are, are super wary. Now they, they will learn and, and if they're around humans, they can become habituated to, to humans and feeding and, and kind of lose that wariness, but a, a wild turkey that spends most of its life out in the, in the forest or in, in the fields is, um, is a tough critter to get close to, really. Um, they have exceptional hearing. It's probably about four times better than humans, and I've heard that they, they can pinpoint a sound a mile away, so if they hear a another turkey calling or a hunter calling, um, they know more or less the exact tree that that, that, that um, sound is coming from and can go right there. Um, our eyesight is exceptional. It's about five times better than humans and they can, they can pick up the slightest movement. Um, I can tell you that from experience. And, and they can't smell. I think Luke mentioned that earlier. Is, is, uh, yeah, their, their sense of smell is, is not well developed, but everything else makes up for it. They're super vocal birds, especially during breeding season. And you all probably know that the gobble of the turkey and the males are the ones that, that make that gobble, but the hens and, and even the, the uh, gobblers will make a variety of other vocalizations. They'll do yelps, they'll do um, clucks, Purrs, a lot of different types of calls to just communicate with the flock uh, for various reasons. So we'll look at the differences between males and females. Like I said, males are called gobblers. Uh, an adult male is often called a tom. A juvenile male is called a jake. And uh, females we call hens, like most like most birds. Uh, and young hens are we call jennies so a lot of terminology there but um, males tend to be bigger there's about 16 to 22 pounds females are quite a bit smaller males are the ones that look kind of black from a distance but they've got a lot of ir iridescence in their feathers and when the sun hits them just right they're really pretty females are going to be a lot duller in color like females of most gallinaceous birds, you know, they want to blend in and be more cryptic colored because they, they have to nest and, um, and hide from, from predators uh, on the ground. Males also are the, the more colorful ones in, in their head. It's a red, that red, white, and blue head that we all think of when we think of turkeys. And uh, they really just kind of engorge it with blood and especially during mating season to uh, to, to uh, try to impress, impress the ladies. Females don't have that. And uh, like I said, they're the ones that gobble and they also will put their feathers up and uh, try to look big and bad and spin around, do little pirouettes. And we call this, this behavior strutting. It's really just displays to other, to other turkeys, um, both, both males and females to uh, try to uh, exert their dominance and, uh, and, and get mating rights. And the females, they don't gobble, but they do, like I said, make a variety of other calls. The most typic typical call is the yelping call. Another notable feature is the males will have a visible beard on their chest, and you can kind of see it on this photo. 
Uh, it's going to be anywhere from five or six inches on a young turkey up to about 10 to 12 inches on an adult turkey. And these are actually modified feathers that sort of appear like hairs. If you look at one up close, it um, just looks like a tuft of hair coming out of their chest. And uh, females do not uh, have a beard most of the time, but up to about five to 10 percent of the hens actually uh, do develop a beard. It's usually smaller and not quite as prominent. Nobody really knows why and uh, doesn't seem to affect anything. They still, research has shown that they still, they still nest and reproduce and have young, uh, just like the um, uh, beardless hens. So kind of interesting. So when it comes to aging turkeys, there's a few things we can look at. And one is that this tail fan. So if you see a bunch of turkeys out in a field doing their thing, strutting around and you see this um, notched sort of pattern in this tail fan or, or a step down. These outer feathers are actually their, their juvenile feathers that haven't grown in yet. And um, so this is indicative of a juvenile, a less than, less than one year old. Adult turkeys, adult toms will have this, uh, this tail fan that's symmetrical the whole way around. Uh, the other notable difference is uh, on their, if you look at their legs, hens don't have a visible spur, whereas uh, jakes, the one-year-old turkeys, will have a, a little nub here starting to grow, and then as they get older, this spur gets longer and becomes very sharp and pointed, and that's a, a tool that they use to, um, to fight with other males for territories and for uh, breeding rights. So I threw this in last minute um, because somebody was talking about turkey poop and uh, and said that you might be interested. And uh, yeah, you can tell what kind of turkey pooped in the woods by the shape of the dropping. And females will have this um, sort of ice cream cone shaped dropping and males often will um, have a J, J shaped dropping. So kind of an interesting fact there. You can also look at their breast feathers. If you just find a few feathers in, in the woods and there'll be a buffy tipped feather on hens, whereas it's a, uh, a black tipped feather on males. So when we look at the history of turkeys in Maryland, we uh, have a lot of, of accounts of turkeys from early settlers that that show that they were probably very common and uh, abundant in, in th really throughout all of Maryland. This, this uh, account here talks about flocks of hundreds in the woods of Maryland. Um, but like with most wildlife species, we, uh, we exploited it and there was unregulated hunting and, uh, and, and, People, people did a number on the population. There was also extensive tim timber clearing, which uh, limited the amount of available habitat. It really drove that population uh, towards extinction within a few hundred years. And in 1919, our state game warden at the time, uh, Lee LeCompte, stated that they were uh, practically extinct, except for a few sections of Western Maryland. And that's that's really where we had turkeys uh, still left was out in the most kind of remote and inaccessible portions of Garrett County, Allegheny County, just the, the steepest ridges and, and the, the places really we couldn't get to. <clears throat> so around 1920, they, uh, they started. Yes. The hunting was it was it for food? Was it for feathers? Was it just for fun? I mean, what, what... probably uh, food, m okay. mostly food. Yeah, yeah. I I don't I don't think that they were really hunted like some like some other birds for uh, feathers for their plumage, really. So, yeah, I think it was mainly just um, for food. So something had to be done. So, the, you know, they did a uh, hunting prohibition 
in the 20s and also began to think about how they could get turkeys back into the rest of Maryland. So, you know, they're fairly easy to raise in captivity. It seemed like a good thing to do to just uh, start a, a state turkey farm and start raising turkeys. And they did this for about 40 years until they realized that it just was not an effective way to restore turkeys to Maryland. They, they released about 33,000 pen raised turkeys. And I, I just, um, by all accounts, it was a, a tremendous failure. They, they, these birds kind of just walked around and didn't, didn't really know that there were predators, didn't know how to uh, nest, raise young, or do any of the other things that, that uh, wild turkeys uh, know instinctively. So they abandoned that program. Um, oh, so this is the turkey range. So even after all that, that occurred, really, we only had turkeys in uh, the western part of, part of the state, you know, just a couple counties. And then I guess this is um, South Mountain here. There were a few uh, remnant birds. And the population was probably down to a, a thousand or less at this time. <clears throat> in the uh, 70s through the 2000s, uh, really the, the bulk of it was from about 1970 through uh, 1995. The uh, DNR with assistance from the National Wild Turkey Federation began a program and this was occurring all over the country. Uh, but it was a, a, a way to restore turkeys using wild, true wild birds. These weren't raised in captivity and uh, they just translocated wild turkeys from where they still existed to other habitats around the state where they had been extirpated. So it was just a trap and transfer program and uh, over a thousand turkeys were relocated during that time frame. And it was a, a tremendous success. This is the kind of the tool that allowed, allowed them to do that so successfully. It's a, called a cannon or a rocket net. It was, it was originally developed for waterfowl, ca for capturing and banding waterfowl. But, um, but the, the turkey biologist kind of quickly adapted it. And it's, it just is comprised of um, uh, three or four of these, these cannons, these metal uh, cannons or rockets. You put some rocket fuel in it. You load, load it up some rocket fuel in here and uh, wire them up and run that wire back to a blind. And uh, we'd sit there and I, luckily I got in on a little bit of this when I first came and uh, it was, it was a, a, a fun time, but we'd uh, bait these turkeys up, uh, you know, find a flock of turkeys, bait them up and the rocket rockets are sitting there the net is inside this box and then when uh when you thought the time was right and all their heads were down you would uh you would detonate it and that uh those rock those rockets would carry that net over the flock of turkeys and hopefully catch most of them but you can see they're really quick some some would uh get away you know just and it it, it goes tremendously quick uh, fast, but the, uh, the birds are, are even quicker sometimes. So it looked like this was still a pretty good catch. We put them in individual boxes and, uh, and take them to another site that didn't have turkeys, but had good habitat and, uh, and released them and let them do their thing. And hopefully they would reproduce and multiply and, uh, and take hold. And, and that's really what they did. It was, um, it was a tremendous conservation success. Uh, we went from a couple thousand turkeys in 1970, and now we've got over 40,000 turkeys in the state of Maryland. So over a fairly short time period, we've, uh, we've really brought that turkey population back. If we look at the densities, so it is sort of like the estimated densities of turkeys in the state. This is based on our uh, spring turkey uh, harvest, but it gives you a good idea of the relative density. And so the darker the color, the, uh, the probably the more turkeys there are there. And so if you want to see, you know, I do get some calls. People want to just go out and see some turkeys. They want to know where to go. And, 
and really the the best parts of the state are those more rural areas all uh, you know western maryland as it has always had a good population eastern shore has good numbers of turkeys um, and then also saint mary's charles county is doing quite well uh, there are there has been large increases in our turkey population in these central central maryland counties and um really just in the, about the last 10 years so uh, they're they're really filling in all the available habitat there and 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 expanding their range and increasing in numbers there so um probably you've you've uh, if you haven't seen any you, you it's very likely that you you will soon in that part of the state so uh, one thing that that does kind of limit them is their habitat. Although they are they're pretty they're pretty much generalist compared to some of our other species. Uh, they they will adapt to a variety of habitats. But the one thing that we that is pretty consistent is that they're found in or near forests. You know they need trees for to provide safe roosting areas. They really don't need a lot of trees, just um, some trees to roost in. And uh, trees also provide them with some food in the form of uh, a mast, acorns, and things like that. But you know, our vision of our or our our understanding of turkey habitat now is a lot different than it was, say, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, turkey biologists at that time thought that they needed vast expanses of unbroken forest. That you know, they just wouldn't put up with with people at all or any kind of development. And we really found that that wasn't the case. It, it was more of a, um, a function of that. That's just kind of where turkeys were. So, so we, we confused it and, and thought, well, that must be what they need because that's the only places they're left. Um, but in reality, they do better in a landscape that's kind of a mosaic of forest and open land. Um, which, which you know, Maryland kind of fits the bill. So that's why they're doing pretty well in Maryland. They'll range over a pretty large area. A lot of a lot of people are are surprised to learn that they'll range over 400 to 2,000 acres of um, habitat. And uh, so they don't. They're not going to stay on one property uh, for for very long. They will move around to to get resources and and do what they need to do. So in the spring, the, like I said, the males at this time, it's all about breeding. So the males are gonna gobble and display, strut around, try to attract the hens. They uh, have a, a, uh, a mating system where one gobbler mates with many hens. And so it's kind of just who's the biggest and baddest is, is kind of how it works out. Uh, those hens are attracted to the to the gobblers that that uh, they think are most fit. Uh, the the jakes oftentimes uh, really jakes rarely mate, and when they do, it's it's typically they don't have viable uh, sperm, so it's it's an unsuccessful mating. So it's usually the adult gobblers that are doing the bulk of the breeding, and this is the time of year when the hens will. <laughs> Uh, be focused on finding a suitable nest site. And so it's all about nesting for them. They typically have a clutch size about nine to 13 eggs and their incubation period is 26 to 28 days. And uh, finding that, that perfect nest site is a challenge for turkeys. Uh, they, there's a high loss of nest due to uh, predators. And so they need to really find a, a nest in, that's in thick vegetation. Uh, the, oftentimes this is in, you know, overgrown fields or hedgerows or uh, even a, a recent timber harvest that is growing back up into some real thick, lush vegetation. Those are the kind of places that turkeys are going to be most successful nesting. Uh, Nest predators just run the gamut. We've got plenty of them in Maryland. We've got uh, foxes, raccoons, possums, skunks, uh, black rat snakes. A uh, lot of things will eat turkey eggs. So to sit on the ground uh, for 28 days uh, and hoping that a predator doesn't find that nest is, is quite a chore. So um, 
that's why nesting habitat is so important at this time of year. And you don't, this is, these are the kind of places that you don't really see turkeys. You know, you see them out in the middle of a field or walking through the woods and, uh, you know, that's where they're visible. They're, they're displaying, they're strutting, but, uh, the hens are kind of slipping off and silently finding these hidden out of the way spots where they can, can hopefully, uh, be successful in nesting. So once those those poults are hatched and the uh, yeah young so young turkeys are called poults, uh, not chicks like like chickens. Uh, so those poults are very precocial. They're going to leave the nest within 24 hours and uh, start following that hen around, and she's gonna she's gonna lead them to hopefully an insect rich area. Um, it, it, that's that's really the key. They have to they have to. Uh, Put on some weight quickly and get to the point where they can fly and start to roost in trees or they're going to get picked off. The, again, there's a lot of predators out there. This is the time period when avian predators really take their toll. Things like Cooper's hawks will, um, will really, really uh, uh, take a lot of young poults when they're small like this. So they need really good habitat. And a lot of times it's in this uh, the form of these grassland or shrubland areas is, is, is what we kind of call them. Um, another term is early successional habitat. It's that young stage of growth that's uh, kind of like if you left a field, sort of like this picture shows here, if you leave a field fallow, the first couple years, it's kind of, you know, you get those weeds and grasses and the brush. That's the kind of stuff that they really need when they're, uh, young and, and need those those insect uh, need those insect resources. Somebody made a comment about the cicadas, and that's that's a really good observation. And they, um, yeah, they, so there's been some research that shows that uh, turkey production, turkey reproduction, tends to improve in years where uh, cicada uh, cicada um, uh, hatches occur. So it'll be interesting to see what happens this year because I think it's um, the hatch, uh, brood X, I believe, if I, if I remember right, was, um, Bob, was another, yes. Another question too. Um, uh, they, they, so turkeys don't lay every day, the wild turkeys don't lay every day like domesticated chickens and turkeys? So they'll lay an egg about every 1.5 1, 1. days on average. So yeah, so the, the, you might do two days in a row and then skip a day. But is it only seasonally that they lay eggs or is it all year long? No, it's just during that breeding season, which is about uh, April, beginning of April through August. Yeah. The bulk of the bulk of the nesting takes place in April and May. And the I would say Half of the poults are hatched out in the beginning of June in Maryland. And then the rest are kind of the rest of the summer. You know, there'll, there'll be some nesting and some re-nesting from, from hens that lose their first nest. Good question. So yeah, so these, these grassland and shrubland habitats are really critical, um, but they'll also make do with field edges, clear cuts, um, power lines or, or roadsides. And this is when you'll see these, uh, these turkeys out there trying to, trying to find some grasshoppers. So I wanted to take a, like a quick little uh, side, side trip and, and talk about this type of habitat and, and how important it is. Um, I, I actually, the, the species that I work with probably more than turkeys is the northern bobwhite quail, which are really in trouble. Populations declined about 98%. Interestingly enough, um, quail and a lot of these other, these other uh, songbirds that, you know, some of these that I have listed up here, you know, need, they're, they're, they need grassland or shrubland habitat, this early successional habitat that we really lack on the landscape these days with you know the advent of, of clean farming and we've cleaned things up and development and the the list of issues goes on and on but um you know turkeys use this 
really during the summer for nesting and and brood rearing but then they you know they use other habitat types the rest of the year so you know they they're a little bit more of a generalist but this type of habitat's really lacking on the landscape it's also super important for pollinators um, so I always just like to kind of give a plug for that and um, and encourage landowners or anybody else has an interest in wildlife to uh, really understand that these these types of areas are really important. This was kind of big news a couple years ago, but the uh, an article in in the journal Science came out and talked about America's birds in crisis, and we've lost uh, 2.9 billion birds. Kind of was picked up in some of the news outlets and things like that. And if you kind of drill down into it, you find out that uh, grassland birds are the suite of bird species that have declined the most. So that's this, this uh, line here. And th this is nationwide data. We're actually a lot worse in Maryland. Um, but, the, you know, the, all birds are declining, but, but uh, grassland birds are, are doing really poorly. And so they really need our help. If we look at the most declining bird species in Maryland, and this is from the Breeding Bird Survey, uh, the uh, standardized survey, it's kind of the gold standard for, for uh, detecting trends. This is the annual rate of decline over the last 50 or so years. So this is every year. And if you add it up, it, it adds up to a lot. So these are the, the top, uh, I think, 15 or so species that are, are, are in, uh, the steepest rate of decline. And what really sticks out to you is everything in red depends on this grassland or uh, shrubland type of habitat. So it's really uh, shocking when you really look at this and, and, and these, these birds are in trouble and they're, they're probably gonna be gone if we don't do something pretty quickly. So we'll switch back to the turkeys that are doing a lot better than quail are, thankfully. Um, or my job would be really challenging. But uh, so in the fall and the winter, turkeys will gather in much larger flocks. And I've, I've seen groups of, you know, 80 or 90 birds uh, mm -hmm. in one flock. And, and really it's all about the food. They're gonna try to get through that fall and winter period eating acorns or waste grain, you know, uh, uh, go out in ag agricultural fields and get some corn. Uh, things like wild grapes or whatever they can find, they're going to um, to locate their home range around those food sources. So a goal of, uh, you know, our turkey management from a, a, when we look at the statewide uh, population, uh, first and foremost, we want to ensure that healthy turkey populations are maintained uh, throughout the state. You know, but we, we also look at things regionally. And we do a lot of surveys and monitoring. Uh, we do a, a, a summer brood survey where we look at, at how many poults are produced per hen. Really uh, interesting data that we get from that. Uh, it will be neat to see if that goes up this year with these cicadas emerging. Um, and if we get some, some better uh, survival of these poults with that, that good, really good quality food source. Um, we also do uh, uh, surveys of hunters and we get some measurements from uh, the, uh, the hunters on the, the health of the turkeys and spur, beard length, things like that. We uh, are also focused on habitat management on both public and private lands. So we'll make sure that uh, we have a good diversity of habitats on our, on our state wildlife management areas and we work with the state forest and uh, state parks to do things on their lands. Uh, and I actually work a lot with private landowners, uh, mainly focused on trying to uh, put some of that, that early successional habitat out there, you know, uh, convert crop fields into native grass uh, fields and, and, and meadows and things like that to uh, provide that, that nesting and brood rearing habitat that's so important for turkeys and a lot of other species. <laughs> and then secondarily, we also, yep. Sorry. <laughs> Is there money available to help um, landowners put in special habitat? Yes, that's a great question. There are a ton of programs out there. Um, most of them are, are federal farm bill programs. 
So you might have heard of like a CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. And there's a bunch of other acronyms that would take me an hour just to get through them. But those are uh, all available to landowners to help them uh, restore wildlife habitat. Um, feel free to send me an email or give me a call. I, I put my contact information at the, the end of this talk and I can hook you up with the right people um, to try to uh, to try to help you. We've, we've got biologists and, uh, and other folks that can provide that technical assistance and kind of go out there, take a look at what you have and set you up with the, the right program and kind of guide you through that process. So great question. But secondarily, we, we want to maintain high quality hunting opportunities for the hunters in, in the state. And we've got about 10,000 turkey hunters uh, currently in the state of Maryland. It's actually been a little bit of an uptick, um, especially this year with COVID. A lot of people are looking for things to do and they want to get out in nature and, and kind of um, uh, get into something new. You know, like these are like first time uh, hunting license buyers. So it's, it's interesting to see. So, like I said, with our, our turkey hunting, we it's it's regulated to make sure that it's a it's going to be sustainable over the long term. So, we have fairly short seasons, and we're very conservative with with our hunting regulations. The primary season, or the the most popular season, is the spring gobbler season, and this takes place during that spring breeding period. It's actually a great time of year to uh, use the resource because like I said, there's the, these males are more or less expendable um, because one male can mate with many females. So it's a good time of year to, to, uh, to have a season for turkeys because we limit that harvest to the male segment of that population only. So we're not impacting any of the uh, nesting that's taking place and uh, those, those females are protected. We also have a, a very limited fall and winter season that it's a much shorter time frame, And th those you can take a, 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 a hen during those seasons, but the harvest is actually really pretty small. Uh, but, but there are still some people that wanna go out and get their Thanksgiving bird uh, from the woods and those seasons allow them to do that. I just threw this in here just to, um, yeah, to kinda, kinda let you know there's there's been this in, interest in hunting recently that uh, really has come about the last five or six years from this uh, sort of a uh, um, the interest is is largely from these young adults so like the maybe the uh, 25 to 35 year olds and they really were wanting to get into it based on their interest in getting organic, you know, free range protein on the table and, and, and really like be more connected with nature. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's, you know, the, the hunting population has been aging for years and years. Uh, average age is getting older all the time. So there's been this, this sort of injection of this new blood into the sport. And uh, it's been good to see. This is one of the programs that, that we, help sponsor and participate in where we, uh, it's kind of a, a field to fork kind of event where we uh, teach them uh, both, both how to hunt and then also how to process the bird afterwards. And uh, a few of them even are lucky to get, get one every now and then. So it's been a, a fun, fun program to be in. And if anybody wants information on that, if you have even the slightest interest in getting involved with hunting and uh, being part of that, um, then uh, feel free to get a hold of me and I can put you in touch with the right folks there. And Bob, whether you're a, whether you're a hunter or not, um, hunters are, are lifelong conservationists because they have to conserve the, the habitat and the, the funds for hunting licenses go to help conserve and protect and uh, those natural resources that we all uh, utilize and, and, and love. Yeah, great, great point, great point. And uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't get into details on that, but um, yeah, basically all of uh, the vast majority of the funding for the Department of Natural Resources uh, comes from hunters, and um, 
either directly through license sales or through the excise taxes on firearms and ammunition and other hunting gear. And uh, that money gets put back into wildlife conservation. And, and I'll be honest with you, uh, game species get, you know, a, a, a portion of that, but a lot of that money goes towards, um, you know, educational programs for non-game species and habitat for non-game species. So, you know, it, the hunters are footing the bill for a lot of really good work that's being done. So that's a, that's a great point. And uh, just uh, one last note is we're getting more of these situations where turkeys are kind of overdoing their welcome. I mean, I loved, I'd love to have turkeys uh, sitting up on my front porch actually, but, uh, but there's quite a few residents of Maryland that do not like this and they they end up calling us and we have to go out and try to figure out what to do with uh, these turkeys that, that are, I, I hate to use the word, but they, they are terming them nuisance turkeys, which, you know, I, I don't like that. Um, uh, I, I, I can think of Canada geese as a nuisance, but I don't like to think of turkeys as a nuisance. But, um, but yeah, typically these situations where uh, turkeys are hanging out in one spot and uh, harassing the kids at the bus stop or the mailman or roosting on the, the front porch or on your roof, Goblin, and we've we've even had that, you know, people complaining about the gobbling is waking them up. Man, I'd love to hear a gobbler out my window, but um, but most of these situations involve people feeding turkeys, and they lose their fear of humans, and they um they get into situations that they shouldn't be. Uh, just a couple years ago, there was a a, a nursing home with uh, one rogue turkey that was in there terrorizing everybody that came out of their door. They chased, chased them back in the, into their house. And they were, there was some of those uh, folks were, were pretty scared of that one turkey. And we had to go up there and spend several, out, uh, several days trying to catch this turkey um, because he somehow knew that, that um, we weren't uh, there to, to help them, you know, we were trying to, trying to get them out of there. So, um, yeah, so please don't feed the turkeys, keep them wild and, uh, observe them from a distance. And I'll just, I'll just finish up by, um, you know, just saying that, you know, this is a, a true conservation success story, you know, bringing back turkeys. And, and this wasn't just happening in Maryland. This was occurring all across the country over the last 50 or so years. And it's, uh, it's, it's great to see turkeys back on the landscape. Um, right now, we're actually dealing with some areas, uh, both in Maryland and particularly in other states where turkeys populations have declined a lot. And so now we're trying to kind of figure out what's going on there and uh, a lot of good research being done, uh, looking at, at why turkey populations might be declining after they have increased for so many years. So, um, yeah, so the, the next chapter is yet to be written in the story of, of the wild turkey. And with that, I'll take any other questions. Stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Bob. We have a couple of questions um, from the, the chat box. One was, do, 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 do. Maureen was interested to know, uh, what do turkeys do in the dead of winter? Because Garrett County's had heavy snow cover for most of this winter. Well, typically it doesn't affect them a whole lot. They'll still find food and figure it out, you know. Um, but if it's really bad, if you get if you get a lot of snow or really bad weather, they'll there's they've been documented just to kind of hang out, sit in the trees for a couple of days and kind of weather the storm. You know, they've they've had they've built up their fat reserves enough that they can they can handle a couple of days of, of not eating. Um, what really gets them worse is the ice. You know, when things are uh, where they can't scratch through the snow, a couple inches of snow they can scratch through. But if it's that hard, crusty ice, that makes it makes life difficult for them. And Brenda um, was interested in coyotes. Has there been any impact on the populations due to the spread of coyotes in Maryland? 
Yeah, so coyotes are interesting. That's a great question. And um, yeah, coy coyotes will eat a turkey if they can catch them, without a doubt. Um, but honestly, most of the research suggests that that coyotes will keep your mid-sized predators um, sort of at bay, so that the, the the population of things like foxes and raccoons will be lower wh where you have coyotes, uh, which can actually be a net benefit to turkeys because those are the predators that are taking a lot of nests. So it's sort of like you're trading a couple adult birds here and there for a whole bunch of nests. And, um, and so it's, it's um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of verdict is still out on it, but I don't think it's the, uh, the, the coyotes aren't the, the evil villain that you might think that they would be with when it comes to things like turkeys. Uh, Bob, since you touched on the quail and how the drastic decline in that, are there any um, efforts to do kind of what that was done with the turkeys in terms of building up the wild populations again and releasing them? Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, it's apples and oranges when it comes to turkeys and quail <clears throat> with what they need. You know, turkeys were were extra or nearly extirpated because of you know hunting and their habitat was altered so much. But then that that habitat actually became it once those trees started to grow and it, it became good turkey habitat after a period of time. But there just was no birds there. So all we had to do, it was, it was re a relatively simple problem. You just had to trap them where they were and move them to where they weren't. And the habitat and the, and the birds did, did the rest. With quail, it's not like that. Our, our landscape isn't conducive to, to turkeys uh, or, or to um, bobwhite quail and some of these other birds. They, um, they, just, they just can't make it, you know, with the, the lack of cover, the lack of habitat, the number of predators we have. Um, so that's, that's really the problem. So you can release pen raised birds all day long and it's not going to, uh, have an, uh, really do anything. Uh, there is some chance that you could get into like moving wild quail to some newly created habitat, but the problem there is quail are declining all across the country and there's really nowhere to get wild quail. So it's a, it's a chance, not like turkeys that are, were pretty, pretty easy to catch. So that's, uh, that's the difference there between those two. And, and really the fact is we just don't have the habitat for quail. It's just not there, so. Do you have any, um, I know that you get information from hunters in terms of the turkey populations. Are there any other kind of community science um, initiatives where folks are out there hiking and send you information on what they see? Um, the only time that we really could use more folks out there is during that summer period. And I mentioned we've got the our summer wild turkey observation survey. Feel free if you want to if you're out and about and you see, you know, even if you might just see turkeys once or twice during the summer, um, I can send you a survey form, which is really quick and easy. Um, just send me an email, say you want to be put on that distribution list. Um, and all, yeah, all you have to do is write down the county, uh, how many adults, how many poults, and how many gobblers, you know, adult hens, poults, and gobblers. And that data all goes into that survey. And it's, it does a really good job of tracking the, uh, the poult production uh, every year. And that's, it's, a, it's a great survey. We have a lot of folks that participate, um, DNR staff, volunteers, birders, just anybody that's out and about might see turkeys. So that's, um, I would encourage encourage you to do that. I put um, Bob's uh, email on there. It's bob.long at maryland.gov in the chat box. If you want to do that. And if you can't get that, you can always uh, email me at bestrong at marylandnature.org. Uh, let's see. Maureen said that there was 12 to 18 inches of snow on the ground for weeks mm. um, so she, it, over in, in the Western Maryland. So she was worried about how the, the turkeys could survive. Yeah, it definitely wasn't easy for them probably, but we haven't, 
really had any documented like uh, events, big die-offs or anything, at least since I've been here with turkeys, even in Garrett County. Um, and and tur turkeys do well the whole way up through Maine and, and they're in Southern Canada. So they're pretty hardy birds and can adapt to that type of thing. All right, does anybody else have any questions? You can raise your hand, you can put it in the chat box. Any other questions about turkeys? Well, Bob, I mean, if I was a UPS driver and I got attacked by a turkey, at least I have a good story to tell my friends <laughs> afterwards after I got off of work. So that, that's one, you know, reason why we should have more turkeys around. They seem to really like school buses for some reason. So many reports of turkeys chasing school buses. I, I don't understand it. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's a color thing. It could be, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, I look around and 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 Bob, everybody looks smarter than when they when they first came on. So you were successful. Um, Very good. Thank you so much for for sharing your knowledge and all that you're doing to help um, our feathered friends in Maryland. Um, I hope that we can get in touch and work with you, that uh, folks who have land can make it into a suitable habitat. Um, now that we're aware of these, these issues moving forward. Um, but thank you so much for all that you do to help our, our feathered friends. And thank Thanks, you all. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, next, ne remember next, Next Thursday, we have Dr. John Lapolo from Towson. He's a myrmecologist, a myrmecologist who's somebody who studies ants. And so we're going to learn all about ants next, next Thursday. And remember, nat it's National Save a Spider Day is Sunday. So we have a special extra Sunday program uh, all about arachnids. And you don't want to miss that. So sign up. Um, you like what we're doing, support us by becoming a member and becoming a community curator. And everyone stay safe, um, enjoy this beautiful weather as we have, and I hope to see you soon uh, online and in person when we can do so safely. Take care, everybody.